especially he is in Apollo Hospital looking after the critical care services. And thereafter, in the afternoon, he goes and checks up on patients and how they sleep. So let me give you a bit of a background of uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan. Uh, he's an American board certified specialist in internal medicine, critical care medicine, and sleep medicine. He has a master's degree in medical management from University of Southern California. Uh, before that, he graduated from Stanley Medical College from our own Chennai, worked in the UK and USA for over 13 years, and came back to India as he was keen on making a difference here. Now, one of the things he's been doing here is uh, developing the critical care speciality. So there is something called the Chennai Critical Care Consultants, icuconsultants.com, a private practice group of critical care specialists. They also do a lot of specialized innovative tele uh, ICU services. They've also successfully established the TACT Academy for Clinical Training, which is India's first simulation-based healthcare training center and has won awards for being for the innovative concept in healthcare education. And they've also been listed for this distinction in the Limca Book of Records. By the way, uh, he's the first board certified sleep specialist in India. So a lot of you who are having trouble with respect to sleep, especially during these times, we'll hear more from him. And being a good entrepreneur doctor, he established the, the Nitra Institute of Sleep Sciences in 2004. It's the first institution to offer a postdoctoral fellowship in sleep medicine and is affiliated to the Tamil Nadu Doctor Med MGR Medical University. He is currently the Vice Chancellor of the Indian College of Critical Care Medicine. He was a past president of the Indian Sleep Disorders Association. He has been honored with a fellowship by the American College of Physicians, American College of Chest Physicians, American College of Critical Care Medicine, Indian College of Critical Care Medicine, and Indian Sleep Disorders Association. Today, we are kind of dividing the talk with him in three segments. The first is, of course, on critical care and really what happens in an ICU. And here I must mention to you that uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan has written two books. Uh, you know, one of them is called ICU Ulla Nadupada Yenna. And the other one he's written is on sleep. You know, Tukam Prachnagal Thirvugal. Now, we are first going to talk about the ICU bit. So, uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan, welcome to you uh, and this busy afternoon for you. I know you are busy as a doctor, but uh, I think a lot of us perhaps still don't understand the gravity of what it is to be in an ICU and what's happening in critical care. I just want uh, you to walk us through what a typical today's situation in an ICU looks like and what's so grim about it. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for um, having me here. When Akila mentioned to me that she wanted me to do an AMA session, uh, I found it interesting because in the medical world, AMA stands for Against Medical Advice. Uh, people leaving hospital, when we tell them not to do it, we call it AMA or Against Medical Advice. So I found that kind of interesting that that's what this is called. So please follow what I'm saying it is, and don't do anything against medical advice. That's what I wanted to start with. Um, today in the ICU, you know, like, and uh, a lot of you are probably hearing that, you know, hospitals are saying they don't have beds, you know, while in fact that, uh, you know, the hospitals are empty and why are private hospitals refusing patients? Why do they not have beds? So several questions amongst the general public. So let me first start with that. Um, for example, let's say you have a 500 to 600 bed facility, like the one that I'm working in, in Apollo Hospital. Uh, what is happening right now is that in general, all the non-emergencies, like whether it is an elective surgery, you know, like people coming into the outpatient department has all come down drastically. So uh, no longer, and, and I would feel free to say this, you know, people used to say when they come into the Apollo Hospital's lobby, it feels like a railway station. You know, they say that, oh God, it's so busy, you know, like we're not even able to come in there. Today, you won't find it like that. You know, when you come in, the lobby might look completely empty, okay? <laughs> People who had trouble complaining of no parking would now find that there's a lot of parking. But then they wonder, why do we not have beds? Uh, to answer that question, broadly today, when we look at admissions, we have those who are admit admitting with emergencies related to COVID disease, and those who are getting admitted related to non-COVID emergencies. As I said, the elective procedures have all come down. So it's broadly COVID and non-COVID emergencies that are coming in. And the COVID emergency seem to be filling our units. You know, we have expanded the number of beds and, uh, you know, like it is not easy. It is not just like converting any room into a COVID room because we need to have the appropriate facilities for purifying the air, having negative pressure. All of those needs to be done. And those units are specifically accommodating the uh, COVID patients. 
we also have an ICU where we try to avoid patients who have COVID and have just the non-COVID emergencies. But having said that, we have been in for some surprises. When we just admitted somebody, I'm just giving a very remote example, with a heart attack, and then they also say that, oh, I have a cough, and then you check and they could have COVID. So while I say that we try to segregate them as COVID intensive care unit or COVID emergencies and non-COVID emergencies, there is a possibility that there could be a little bit of a mix that could happen, particularly when the symptoms are unclear in the beginning. So when we walk into the ICU today, I would assume every patient has COVID. You know, so, and therefore we need to appropriately use personal protective equipment and then go in to see the patients. So every time I walk in, I have to wear a personal protective equipment. Um, again, when you're walking into the COVID ward where we know it is positive, we uh, wear this first, the procedure is called donning. So it's quite a significant thing, depending on whether we are going to manage patients on ventilator, we might put a full suit or for those who are managing patients who are not on a ventilator, they may be using a mask, gown, you know, face shield and all of those, all adequate to ensure that there is no transmission of the droplets or the virus. So we go in and guess what? Most of our patients, forget patients, you know, most of our own colleagues, nurses cannot recognize us because we are often fully suited. So they don't even know who is at the other end. You know, we'll have to introduce ourselves and start what we are doing. And once we go in and we are donned with all these personal protective equipment, we may be there for several hours sweating inside, uh, but we'll have to finish, you know, the, our rounds or whatever we need to do inside. If we need to take a bio break, we need to talk, which is basically there is a process, there is a protocol on how we remove all the personal protective equipment in a dedicated space because that has to be disposed appropriately and then come out of the unit. And after I come out, if I get called in for any reason, yes, we have uh, attempted to do some video monitoring so that you don't have to go in for everything if there are questions asked, if we could clarify to the nurses or the junior doctors who are inside. But if I have to go in, I have to go through the whole process again of donning a new personal protective equipment. So in summary, the ICUs are a very different place now because often, as I said, we have to be using these personal protective equipments. It is not easy. It is extremely uncomfortable to be inside those personal protective equipment for hours together. Um, I, you know, like our doctors, when they come out, I call them my, you know, sweat boys and sweat girls because they're extremely sweaty coming out, you know, like often wanting to have another shower, change again, go back inside. Uh, it's very, very challenging. Uh, but um, as much as people won't hear, I mean, like to hear this term, I think it's an absolutely fascinating disease. You know, every day we are learning new things. I mean, we, we thought we knew how to manage a viral illness, a viral respiratory failure, somebody on a ventilator. But we are being proved wrong every day. Okay, you talked about this viral infection being quite different. What are the you know what are the travails of the healthcare professionals in managing this particular viral infection? Apart from the PPE, which is a big challenge, you also had issues with the sanitizer and you know we are seeing terrible photos of healthcare professionals' fingers looking like some aliens' uh, limbs and all that. So what really is happening with the A, with the viral infection, and B, what's the impact on the health and the well-being of the healthcare professional itself? Okay, first let me start with your question on the viral infection. You know, like we have dealt with several viral infections in the past, you know, whether it is uh, influenza, whether it is a swine flu, whether it's a Middle Eastern virus, whether it was a SARS. Yes, we have had several epidemics. Uh, the influenza was a pandemic in the 80s. So yes, we have gone through several viral illnesses. Usually, for a lot of the viral illness, uh, there is not an antiviral medication that's available readily, particularly when we first notice it. Think about the good old days when we had chickenpox. You know, often, and even today, the medications that we use are more for limiting the severity. It is not to completely, uh, you know, treat the underlying chickenpox. So we, you know, use medications, but we often use what is called supportive treatment. So we just make sure that if there is a fever, you know, you treat them. If they have body ache, you treat them. Um, so that is how most of the viral illnesses are often dealt with. In fact, in chickenpox, they often used to say it is better to get it in childhood because if you get it at a later age, it can even be more severe and therefore, you know, it is better to get it at a younger age. Then we understood better that, you know, like once somebody gets a chickenpox, they get immunity and often may not get a recurrence or a second time. But if they do get a recurrence, it may even take a different form. For example, the herpes zoster or the shingles, you know, that we uh, notice. 
So, you know, this is something that we have taken years and years to understand. And as I said, even today, when we give a medication, it tries to uh, reduce the severity of the illness. That's what we do. Think about the other ones, influenza, common cold, you know, like common influenza often is very mild. You know, a lot of people may get fever, may get a cough, may get a sore throat, may get some, you know, like congestion of the upper airway or, you know, they may feel like uh, coughing some phlegm. But most of the times it could be self-limited to the extent that we tell them, please don't take antibiotics when it's a viral illness because the antibiotics are not for the viral illness. It is only if you are having a secondary, what we call bacterial infection that you need to take it. Otherwise, just, you know, like doing all this, drinking a lot of fluids, you know, keeping yourself hydrated should take care of it. So this is how we were dealing with the common cold and the influenza. Then came some of these that took severe forms and particularly, you know, remember the SARS and remember the, you know, swine flu, where, you know, we found that, you know what, suddenly this is taking a very severe form and people are getting to need ventilator support, you know, they're needing uh, significant respiratory support and therefore, you know, like we started dealing with them a little differently, trying to identify them early, you know, making sure that they get the support earlier than later so that, you know, the mortality could be reduced. Interestingly, every time we face these pandemics, they seem to take a little different form. You know, like the swine flu, the first time around when we had it, we found that there were a lot of young people. You know, there were pregnant women, there were obese people who were getting the swine flu. The second time around, it was completely different. A lot of elderly people were, you know, like getting it. So now we've started getting used to this swine flu where we know that, okay, yeah, you know, like if people get it, sometimes it could be mild. If it is severe, this is what we do. Again, no major antiviral drug that has been proven to be effective for swine flu. Okay. Now, why is this different? Why is this, you know, COVID-19 different? Number one, it seems to be a lot more contagious than most other viral influencers that we have seen. And therefore, the numbers are alarmingly high. So it is not only the treatment of the individual, but it's a huge public health problem where we need to scale up quickly to deal with the large numbers of patients who are going to need support. So that is one thing that the healthcare has to uh, work towards. The second thing is the way it is behaving seems to be very different. There are people who have come looking normal, feeling normal, but after a period of time, suddenly deteriorate. And then, you know, they may develop some problem. There are others who, you know, just come in, unfortunately, you know, like deteriorate very, very rapidly. And it is extremely difficult to give them enough oxygenation, despite putting them on a ventilator, maximum amount of ventilatory support, maximum amount of oxygen, and they rapidly deteriorate. Now, I don't say this to make it alarming, but what I want to reinforce is the fact that it does seem that people who are older, people who have comorbidities, by that I mean, you know, other chronic diseases, particularly those having, you know, diabetes or any kind of uh, disease that could lower their immunity, you know, like rheumatoid arthritis, or if they're on steroids for a long time, or if they have an underlying lung disease, or if they have a transplant before and taking what we call immunosuppressants, all of this seems to make them more vulnerable to severe disease and they may rapidly deteriorate. Um, again, alarming figures, but internationally it has been found that you know, people who have severe COVID disease who have gone on a ventilator, the outcome seems very, very poor. And you know, the mortalities have been as high as 75 to 80%. But having said that, now to the positive side, of all the people who have COVID disease, almost 80% of them get only mild disease. So please don't panic. Everybody doesn't get that. What we see is a very, very biased population. We are only seeing the sickest of the sickest. So I do not even want people in the community to think that everybody who gets is going to get severe disease. 80% of the people who have the problem continue to have mild disease, invariably just fever, sore throat, maybe some headache, body ache, and then they resolve with just taking some, you know, like painkillers and uh, do much, much better. So this is just in general, I wanted to talk about viral diseases and how this is uh, different. Your other question was on our hand washing. Is that what you asked? No, how the travails of the healthcare professionals and how they, they are managing and coping with the severe stress on themselves. Okay, great. I'm glad you asked me this. Um, this is unpublished data, but we have just done a survey amongst our own healthcare professionals. And you would be surprised that um, more than 50% are depressed or have some kind of anxiety. Moderate, but they all, uh, more than 50% had at least moderate depression and moderate anxiety. So the psychological wellness seems to have taken a big toll. 
uh, particularly when a peer, a colleague falls sick, the morale goes down very, very, very you know, uh, low to a lot of people. Um, interestingly, what we found in this analysis is that younger people, particularly those who are either single or who are the primary breadwinners of the family seem to have higher amount of depression and anxiety compared to even the older healthcare professionals who seem to have uh, less of it. Women seem to have more than men. And that again may be a little biased because of all the healthcare professionals we interviewed, several of them were nurses. So, you know, that could uh, have been a factor. But what was important was that this amount of depression and anxiety was no different whether they were actually providing bedside care for COVID patients or not. Okay. So not everybody is in the COVID ICU. There are so many nurses taking care of patients in the regular ward. Even they seem to have this fear and anxiety. And that's something that's extremely common. So that's number one. The second thing that we are noticing is even a little bit of any kind of these symptoms, because they're seeing all these patients so sick, they seem to be worried. You know, when they get... Uh, you know, just body ache, then they get worried whether they could have COVID. So uh, manpower planning is becoming a huge, huge issue because, you know, we, uh, it's already difficult to get skilled manpower in healthcare consistently, you know, like particularly nurses, there's a huge turnover every two years, you know, nurses leave, particularly with, you know, Middle East and other countries opening up. Of course, right now, that is something that is not happening. So we're able to retain them. But, you know, like retaining manpower, working out rosters to ensure that you know they feel that they're off sufficiently to get back into this uh, all that has been challenging but having said all of that you know if any of you come in and see how they are working once they are inside it's amazing absolutely amazing you know like they forget what it is they do what they have to do but then they probably have this you know inner anxiety fear which all manifests later on and uh, uh, I, I would say that it has taken a significant toll, particularly on the psychological wellness um, and also to some extent on the physical, but more on the psychological. Now, now, that, now that you've spoken about the healthcare professionals, you know, fellows like us, the prospective patients are maybe not yet patients, hopefully. <laughs> you know, what are the things you see us doing wrong? You know, what are the things we could be doing better? Okay. All right. Let me, you know, since you said prospective patients, I know I, I can't let you go with that. <laughs> But let me tell you, um, unfortunately, this is like common cold. If you haven't got it, you may get it. Okay, so don't panic on that more. You may get it. All I can say is let's hope it's going to be mild and just goes away like a common cold. Let's hope that each one of us here, you know, and everyone else belongs to that 80% and not the 20%. So that's the best we can hope for. But it is so rampant that everyone may get it. You know, like I sometimes feel that I may either have already got it or I may get it later. I don't know. You know, so because we interact so much and that's quite a poss uh, possibility um, so you, if you ask me what are you doing right and what are you doing wrong once again the preventive measures that i've shown to help are number one you know i would call it physical distancing you don't want to socially distance from people you want to physically distance yourself from people that's exactly what you're doing so physical distancing seems to help because you know even talking or if they cough, you know, any of those would definitely spread the aerosols and if they have it, and that can be an issue. And you don't know when you're walking around, when you're talking to people, you don't know who has it. And therefore, you know, like it is good to be taking that precaution of maintaining the distance, particularly when you're going for a shopping and all that. I see all these boxes and circles mar marked in several of the retail stores and stuff. Please do follow that. That would make a tremendous difference. Number two is wearing a mask. You know? I see two extremes. There are people who are going a little overboard, you know, wearing masks all the time, even inside the house, you know, when they are alone or, you know, not necessary. You don't have to go to that extreme. But whenever there is a possibility of an exposure, it is good to wear a mask. And for the general public, I think wearing a cloth mask is reasonable. Okay. And I think that would be something that you can use. Inside the hospital, of course, we use, you know, like depending on whether we are going into an isolation patient, we may use what is called an N95 mask or otherwise we use what is called a three-ply mask. So it is a little different, but some kind of a mask that is appropriately covering the nose and the mouth is important. Now, why am I saying this? 
I do see some patients who insist on coming. We do a lot of teleconsultations and I can talk about that later on. But sometimes I do see patients in the outpatient setting where, you know, when they come in, we put them through all the, you know, standard protocols. When they come in, their temperature is checked. They're asked to wash their hands. They're asked whether they have a mask. They're supposed to wear it. If they don't have one, we give them one. You know, all of these are being done. And then they come into my room and, you know, we have separated the, you know, across the table that there is sufficient distance that they sit far away from me all of those and guess what they do after they come in and sit they will remove the mask and when i ask them why do you do this they say oh you may not hear what i'm talking thank you you know that's still okay for me <laughs> so i always tell them it's perfectly fine you can hear me i can hear you so please use the mask so that is um, the other thing so follow what has been you know widely being told about the social distancing slash physical uh, physical distancing norms and using the mask when it's appropriate. And please try to avoid crowded spaces. And that is the reason all this, you know, section 144, they don't want larger crowds, all that. But unfortunately, I don't see people following those things. You know, like I still see people, um, I hate to see this, you know, I'm, I'm all for physical fitness. But when I see people running in the morning, when I go to work, you know, six o'clock, seven o'clock without a mask, that absolutely I feel is not being responsible. I think, you know, while you want to focus on your physical uh, fitness, I think you're compromising for so many others and yourself. Okay. Now, one of the things that uh, I know your allopathy and all that, but, you know, there's the Siddha school and there's Ayush and everything. And the big talk about this building of immunity. And the Tamil Nadu government is a big one for distributing Kabasura, Kudinir, etc. I said, I know you're an allopath and there is a natural bias against some of these things. But what about this concept of immunity and stuff like this, this Kabasura, Kudinir, et cetera, et cetera? What's your take on it, doctor? Sure. See, first of all, I don't have a bias. Um, I, I do want to say that every system may have its own place. I just say that I don't know about it. You know, my knowledge is limited to allopathy and that doesn't undermine a Siddha or a Ayurveda or a homeopathy in any way. Okay. Having said that, I completely agree that, you know, we need to maintain good immunity, good nutrition. It's almost like, you know, like uh, we talk about the pillars of, you know, wellness and basically, you know, like good sleep, good exercise, you know, good nutrition and good psychological or emotional well wellness. You know, all these are important for uh, being, you know, healthy and well. So, you know, like definitely whatever we can do in the form of natural ways to boost our immunity, eating good food, and as I said, regular exercise, all of those would make certainly a difference. None of this happens overnight. You know, like, uh, uh, that's one thing I could say even about, you know, like other forms of medicine. I'm, I'm talking about the non-allopathy. It may help build immunity over a period of time, but it doesn't happen overnight. Don't expect, you know, if, that if you have kapas or a kudani, next morning your immunity is better and that you're going to be perfectly fine and you're never going to get corona. Don't have that kind of a hope, but if you haven't done all these necessary things in a long while and now you want to take a start, yes, absolutely, you know, like take whatever is recommended, naturopathy, you know, whichever system you believe, and it's good. The one thing, uh, and I'm not talking about now or about the wellness, but in general, the one thing I tell my patients who come to me is don't mix multiple systems of medicine when you're taking something internally. And the reason for that is, you know, like an allopathic might say, oh, you know what, I think it is related to your Ayurvedic or a homeopathic. And you go to the Ayurvedic person, he may say that, no, no, it's your allopathic medicine that's causing the side effect. So it may be difficult because of our lack of knowledge of other system. Each one may lack a knowledge uh, of the other system and may quote unquote blame for the side effect. So I would just say in the long standing illnesses, for example, like a diabetes or like a hypertension, if you're saying I'm taking this and that, you don't know which would which is doing good and which is doing bad. So that's where I avoid. But today's situation, when it comes to just boosting the immunity, general wellness, sure, whatever works is fine. Great. There are a couple of questions from the audience. Sure. One is, a, uh, is I think, a question that like, people like me are a little worried. They know A positive, a, a group is more prone to this, while O positive is less prone to this. Is that really a fact or, you know, it's just uh, nonsense? <laughs> See, um, you didn't ask me this question when I asked, told you that uh, when people with comorbidities are more prone, you didn't ask me whether that was nonsense, right? I mean, so why I'm bringing that up is as we understand the disease better, as the numbers are more, it's number crunching. I mean, you guys are better than me, in that, you know, like, so it's number crunching where you look at patterns of behaviors and you may find that, you know what, I mean, there are so many other things that have been associated with 
blood groups and malignancies, blood groups and other diseases. Yes, you know, there may be pattern. Uh, how does it matter? You can't change your blood group right now, right? So uh, you have to accept it. Uh, even if it is, I don't think it's worth thinking every day, oh my God, I'm A, A positive. When am I going to get Corona? And that's probably going to ruin you more than actually getting it sometime when it could just be mild. So yes, you know, knowledge is good, but don't, uh, you know, like, be too concerned about these things. Yes, it may be a pattern that's observed. I told you when the first time the swine flu came, people who are obese and people who are pregnant, that doesn't mean every pregnant woman got it. It just means that the numbers were more amongst pregnant women. So that's how it is. The just a more a pattern. Now, another question is uh, things like vitamin C, D, zinc, etc. Yeah. Again, you know, especially overseas, there's a belief that all this helps in improving your immunity and resistance to it. True? Yeah. So, I mean, there's... Um, pros and cons. A lot of studies have looked at, you know, using this long term, particularly for, uh, you know, building the immunity. And as it was rightly said, you know, zinc helps in recovery, healing, same with vitamin C. People are taking cocktails of these. Okay? So again, uh, nothing is without side effects. So I wouldn't take it lifelong, you know, like I'm a vegetarian and, you know, a lot of vegetarians are often B12 deficient. Uh, I also get some leg cramps and, you know, I have some varicose veins. I'm just giving my own example. I have no problems in mentioning this. So I take some vitamin E, but I don't want to take this every day. So what I tend to do is I take either a month of vitamin B12, next month of, you know, vitamin E. So about six months a year, I would probably take both or I would take it on alternate days. Why I'm bringing this up is excess of anything is not good either. Taking it for a period of time is absolutely fine, but nothing is free of side effect. Vitamin C is a, what we call a water-soluble vitamin. So you excrete it in urine if it is excess. But there are reports of you know, people developing oxalate kidney stones with too much of vitamin C. So we just need to be careful. You know, good old grandma giving you lemon is vitamin C. You know, taking oranges you know, is vitamin C. So we can mix it in different forms. You don't necessarily need to load yourself with all these supplements. But taking it for a period of time is certainly not harmful. And if it helps, it's perfectly fine. A lot of people are either believers or non-believers in supplements. You know, uh, there are very few who are in between. There are some who love supplements. They just say it's good. Fine. There are some who say I will never take it. Fine. So it's just a matter of, you know, what you want. To One doctor I talked to said, you know, the way of getting expensive urine. <laughs> so, <laughs> which was a little bit much. But, it looks like much. It too. but you know, there's another thing, you know, this thing about testing. There's a lot of controversy. And some people are very anxious to get themselves tested and all that. What's your take on this? You know, should I get myself tested when I show no symptoms? What really is your... your, your uh, Professional. Right now, what is recommended is let's say that somebody has just a fever and a sore throat and you know maybe some lack of smell, uh, nothing else. You know they're not feeling breathless, they're not feeling too tired, exhausted. They're able to eat reasonably well and can stay at home. Usually now in these kind of people, we just tell them, please stay at home. You don't even need to get tested. You know you quarantine yourself in a single room where nobody else comes in, okay? Now that's the hard part. That's why I'm you know, specifying that a little bit more. You know, we live in India where you know, a lot of people live in apartments, a lot of live, people are in much smaller uh, you know, dwellings where they cannot isolate themselves. Then they end up going into the hospital, in which case they automatically start getting tested. But if you can be at home, there is no need to be testing for the mild illness, okay? And you can just recover from it after about 10 to 14 days, things are fine, you just go back. Even in the hospital, things are changing. You know, like earlier, when I say earlier in March, when people came in, they got tested. And after about 10 days, they got retested and they needed to have two negative tests before they could be discharged home. Can you imagine the amount of resources, not only for the testing, but also they may remain in hospital for long. And we also started understanding the disease better that there may be dead virus in your system, which is in the lung and thing. And some people remain positive much, much longer. There are people who are absolutely asymptomatic, have recovered, but they remain COVID positive. So that doesn't mean that you can keep them in a hospital or isolate them forever. So mm -hmm. the thought now is that if you are having mild illness, particularly if you don't have breathlessness, you are not requiring any kind of oxygen. And if you have the facility and you can check what is called the pulse oximeter, you know, basically checking your oxygen level, if it is maintaining over 93, 94%, you can stay at home. One of my very close friends, I'm managing that way at home. He keeps calling me every day and he's doing absolutely fine. You know, very educated person, has an independent room. He's able to do all of this. The family is able to support this and he can do it. 
if you can't do this, if you're not able to isolate and if you have any concerns or if you become breathless and breathlessness seems to be the main thing that we keep you know, reinforcing over and over again, then you need to go into the hospital and you will get tested. Okay? Now, the second group is the contacts, you know, people who have had COVID and then uh, once again, previously, you know, we're tracking all the contacts, you know, checking everyone. It's not required to go and do COVID testing on everyone. Today, what we do is, yeah, once again, if they have symptoms, if they have concerns, then we may go test them. Otherwise, we don't. Now, people are sometimes unhappy that, oh, I'm not even able to get a COVID test. Okay. Please understand, if it is medically necessary and the doctor orders, it can be done. You know, Yes, there may be some limited, you know, I, I think in a day, Tamil Nadu is testing over 30,000, which is, in my opinion, reasonably good because we, I think, are the largest testing state in the country. We have tested more than 1 million and even none of the larger states have done that. So we are quite reasonable and I think uh, we are also reasonably transparent and I'm going to you know, be a little cautiously uh, saying that in the numbers and all of that. So I think we need to accept that. Don't go and you know test everyone just because they have a cough, sore throat. Uh, it's not something to be you know happy or sad labeling yourself as corona positive or negative. Okay? I think that mindset needs to go. This is like anything else, you know, like a woman can't go and get pregnancy test every day. Okay? <laughs> and similarly, you know, when you have a cold, you don't go and get a blood test every day. So I really don't think doing corona testing is going to make a difference. COVID testing will do a difference unless you have symptoms. Okay, now there is talk of uh, the Bharat Biotech coming out of the vaccine. There are some of these drugs. I know the U.S. has cornered all the supplies of remdesivir from Gilead Life Sciences. Uh, so where are we really, you know, very quickly for the lay audience, A, with respect to potential cures like, like remdesivir or whatever, and B, with respect to a vaccine. Do you think really, honestly, a vaccine can come within less than five years, two years, etc.? Okay. First, with regards to the medications that are available, as I said, we have been evolving on what seems to work. Current, you know, like initially there was so much of, uh, you know, popularity or publicity for hydroxychloroquine. Then we just went completely back and said, hey, you know what, keep away from it kind of a thing. Then something else came, something else came, you know, like uh, lopinavir, ritinavir. There were so many other medications. Today, if you ask me if there's one medication that has been proven to help, actually it is dexamethasone, which is steroids mm -hmm. in patients who are sick, those who are requiring oxygen and higher, and those who are on a ventilator. There, there is a study called recovery study that has shown that people of that category seem to benefit when you give them the appropriate dose of steroid. Okay. The next one, uh, and that is more, it is modulating your immunity. So it's a different style of working. Amongst the antiviral drugs, the one that has been shown to be of benefit is actually remdesivir. Again, not for everyone who is just having a cough or a sore throat. It's only when they are requiring oxygen or more. That is when we put them on remdesivir. And strangely enough, unlike steroids, here we find that once they become so sick to be on ventilator, it may not be that helpful. Whereas those who are on oxygen, you know, what we call hypolonase, it seems to be helpful. So it's a knowledge in evolution. Today, if you ask me, these are two drugs that are shown to be of value. Um, it's, we are yet to be convinced about, you know, Papnover, the new uh, tablet that has come for mine. Uh, you know, this is how, uh, for convenience, I don't usually use trade names, but I'm telling you, Tamiflu is something that people have been very comfortable taking for, uh, you know, swine flu and other things. Once again, it has not been shown to clearly have antiviral effect, but it seems to limit the severity of the disease and therefore people take it for five days. So uh, with regards to stocks and stuff, I think the government has to keep working. And uh, yes, you know, there is also an Indian company that's coming up with Remdesivir. Hopefully, you know, like we should be having stocks of those and not that everything goes to America that hopefully doesn't uh, um, happen. Uh, lastly, but not least with regards to the vaccine, Vaccine is a process in evolution. I mean, like uh, people uh, need to build immunity. Even if you take your vaccine today, it's not like tomorrow you are immune to you know, developing uh, COVID. So it is a process in evolution, but there seems to be some hope. Uh, you know, the, from my gut feeling and the scientific feeling is that it will take at least till the end of the year or next year to, for us to have some reasonable vaccine that can be, you know, in a way that's available. Uh, but it's not a cure-all, you know, please don't think that tomorrow when you get it, day after you, by the time we get the vaccine, you know, we may not even have COVID and people may not even want to take the vaccine unless there is a, see, I mean, how many adults are routinely taking influenza vaccine every year? Correct. Even those, so it might become like that. 
Now tell me, there's a lot of, uh, suddenly I found a lot of people in my apartment complex and many other complexes buying this gadget called the oximeter. Yeah. Okay. Now, is this really correct that once you touch below uh, numbers like 95 or 93, you're in trouble and, you know, can we every day keep checking our, uh, the, the, the oximeter? What's your uh, opinion, doctor? It's good to have it if it works. Okay. <laughs> Why I'm saying that particularly is one of our own doctors, you know, a critical care colleague got a pulse oximeter okay. and it showed ridiculously low numbers. It said 70 or something. He said, there's no way, man. I'm you know, breathing fine. I'm doing okay. And then he took it and kept it on the table and it was still showing 70. Okay. Without even his finger being clasped to it. The way this works is, you know, it is feeling, uh, I mean, the pulse oximeter is going to, uh, you know, tell you what is the percentage of oxygen saturation. And yes, it needs to be over 93 to 94% when you are normal, breathing on room air, when you're walking and comfortable. So having one is fine, but not to the level of getting paranoid and obsessive about checking your oximetry every 10 minutes or every one hour. That's not the recommendation. But if you have corona um, or suspicion of a COVID and you are isolating yourself and you want to decide on when to go into a hospital, certainly it's a useful way. Particularly, you know, a lot of doctors now do teleconsultation. Nurses can look at you remotely. And if you tell them your parameters, it helps to decide whether you need to come into a hospital. Yes. Okay. Now there are a lot of, uh, you know, things like which can I get newspapers at home? Should I wash the vegetables and fruits which I buy outside? What should I do with provision? Should I put that all solution or some other thing, you know, and wash them? Uh, what really would you suggest very quickly to allay these fears? I think the newspaper issue was sorted out before, you know, like it went to the extent where newspapers were wondering whether they should stop publishing, you know. Uh, the question is, th these fomites, you know, whatever we are touching, how much can it transmit? I mean, can there be, if somebody coughs into a newspaper, can the virus be there? Yeah, yes, it can be there. It can be there for some time. It can be a matter of, you know, minutes to an hour that it can be there. It's possible. The second thing is, how does it get carried in your hands? Okay. So that's the reason. If I go to buy a newspaper, obviously I would use a mask. I would get a newspaper. You know, when I come back and leave the newspaper, I would wash my hands and then start reading the newspaper. That's absolutely fine. The risk of transmission on that is extremely low. With regards to washing vegetables, it's always a good thing to wash vegetables, not just now, but always. You know? So washing it in just clean, pure running water, pure, I don't know, but you know, clean running water <laughs> is you know, good enough to go to an extreme of you know, spraying stuff and all that is not required. But if that makes you feel more comfortable, it's fine. Certainly wouldn't use too much of chemicals to wash it. You know, that's not a good idea uh, in general. There are people who are a little bit more comfortable when they buy stuff, you know, groceries and stuff to leave it in sunlight for some time, which as I said earlier, it may help to, you know, kill the virus or, you know, like if it is, if it is there in, as a transmission in, through the fomite, it might help. So it can't hurt, but please don't use bleach and chemicals on top of it because that might cause other kind of harms when you are consuming those kind of food. So, you know, uh, keeping them in a dry place in sunlight is absolutely fine washing whatever you can wash in running water is fine but beyond that i don't think it is required okay now you know as a as a you are also an individual you know you are also somebody who's worried about his health how exactly are you personally managing your situation <laughs> i think it's a very very valid thing we're all human beings and you know we are worried about ourselves and our family so what do I do? Number one, in my house, my wife and daughter have hardly left home since the lockdown. They've never left, you know, like I think maybe once, but nothing other than they don't even go shopping. They are inside the house. I am the only one who goes out and I go out every day. You know, I have to go to work, you know, I come back. So I do all the grocery shopping. I do all the, you know, like vegetable shopping, whatever is required. And I bring it and leave it. And as I said, it is washed with water. And yes, it is left for drying for some time if it is appropriate, whatever we get. When I go to work, I nowadays start wearing scrubs. You know, I'm sure you've seen us all in scrubs. And then when I come back, I leave my slippers outside. I walk in and go straight into the shower. And yes, I put my clothes in, you know, a bucket with maybe a detol or something like that and leave it there to soak. Have a shower and only then come out and see or talk to any of my people. So that's the level of, you know, care that I need to take. And if I go out for getting groceries, getting newspaper, I always use a mask. And, you know, as I said, you know, 
following social distancing, physical distancing norms when I'm outside, all those I follow, but nothing additional. These are the common things that anybody should do and that's what I do. Okay, now I know there's some more questions, etc. Some of them are from a Dr. Sri Ganga is a very technical question. So I'll probably bring it a little later. Uh, and there are questions about potassium permanganate, but you've answered all of those, you know. Uh, uh, so now, uh, I, how is your sleep, doctor? I want to move to the next segment. So that I just want to ask you, how, how well do you sleep? I sleep absolutely fine. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Except one night, and I will tell you about that later on. Um, in general, you know, I am the kind who sleeps on time, wakes up on time. I cannot almost keep awake after 10.30, and I cannot almost stay in bed after 5, 5.30 in the morning. So I'm one of those seven-hour sleepers, some, sometime between 10.30 to 5, 5.30. And I continue to maintain that cycle. I do continue to do my morning walk, morning exercise. You know, I go to my terrace or I do some stretch exercises inside the house or yoga, whatever I can do in the morning. So continue to do some activity. A little cautious about eating because when you are more at home, you know, like, uh, you know, you tend to consume more. So be a little extra cautious on that, you know. Uh, but the good thing is it's all home food now. You know, we all mm -hmm. are not going out. We are not ordering out. So that way it is a lot more healthy. I do my share of the household work. You know, I certainly do whatever it takes to wash the dishes or help with you know, cooking and all of that. So it definitely, you know, helps me to maintain my routine as much as possible. And honestly, my routine hasn't changed too much. So I'm able to sleep. <clears throat> Whereas people whose routines have changed are having sleep. Okay. Uh, now, one of the things, you know, my mantra, you know, I'm very crude. I'm sorry to the audience in advance. It has been very simply GNS, GMS, okay? Which is a good night's sleep and a good mornings. I don't want to say the second part of that word, okay? But basically, I believe that if you don't sleep well and you don't have morning ablutions very well, something is wrong. Would you say sleep is a symptom or bad sleep is a symptom of something going wrong or it is itself uh, the cause? Actually, it is chicken or egg first. Okay, Honestly, it can be both. Um, sleep can be a symptom of your underlying problem. And I will give you this one example. I told you that uh, uh, there was an issue that happened where you know somebody walked in without personal protective equipment inside a, a ICU. Okay? And I had heard about it that day. And that night I woke up with a dream saying that I was in a place without you know, uh, personal protective equipment. That woke me up. That was the night I told you I didn't sleep too well. Okay. So why I'm bringing this up is, yes, sleep problems can be a manifestation of something that's going on with you, whether it is physical problems or whether it is psychosocial problems. It can definitely impact the sleep. On the other hand, if you don't sleep well regularly, particularly if the sleep disorder becomes chronic, it can impact tremendously your physical health. People who don't sleep well are clearly shown to have re uh, reduced immunity to the extent they may not respond to vaccines. Okay. Yeah, so it has okay. been chronic sleep deprivation has been shown to do that with some of the <clears throat> you know, prior vaccines. It has also been shown to cause hypertension, to cause diabetes, to cause heart disease, stroke, a lot of hormonal changes, you know, like people, I am, young women can have menstrual irregularities. Infertility has been more associated when there are chronic you know, sleep problems. So, and depression, anxiety. So there are a lot of issues that can happen without good night's sleep if it remains for a long time. Not having a sleep for one night doesn't do all of these things. If it is persistent, it can be an issue. Okay, what I've done is we've got a little poll for the audience, you know. Uh, so Saurav, I'll just request you to put question one and let's see what the responses look like. The question really is, how often has poor sleep troubled you in the last month? So I'll just request you to Wow. Okay, so you have very often, uh, and sometimes are almost, uh, you know, 70%. 65 to 70%. And very few have no problems. Once you are done with your poll. Yeah. So shall I share the report now? Share the yes, please. But only only eighteen or four. So okay, let's put it. Okay, only few of them have answered. Okay, good. Anyway, we let's go with this. Uh, you know, is this mirroring what you are seeing in your practice, doctor? Yes. 
Okay, so what we have noticed, and uh, we are describing this, and hopefully we'll publish it. Uh, we're going to call this lockdown sleep syndrome. Okay, so what has been happening is whenever we ask people, even those who have not had previous sleep problems are now developing sleep problems. Okay, those who have already had sleep problems are experiencing that it is worse now. Okay, so definitely the sleep problems have increased, and broadly this is due to a few reasons. Number one is reduced activity. Okay, their work schedule has changed. A lot of them are working from home. Um, that, of course, you know, is a whole thing to talk about. You know, yeah, maintaining etiquette, how you do it, you know, would make a huge difference. So the lifestyle has changed. So that is activity level. Number two is reduced sunlight exposure because people are always inside a closed space and not having enough sunlight can affect our body's ability to secrete melatonin in the night. And that can impact the sleep. So that is the second most common reason that we are finding. Then the third one is fear and anxiety about the disease, about COVID on, you know, will they get it? Somebody known to them got it, how they, you know, responded or, you know, succumbed to it or whatever. All those fear about the disease seems to be the third most common reason. reason. And number four is fear and anxiety and uncertainty in general about the future. You know, uh, and I'm talking to a group of entrepreneurs who all probably face this, you know, how are we going to cope with this? You know, how do we? Uh, so these are the four top reasons that we are finding where people are experiencing. Uh, it may be a combination of these. I'm not saying it has to be one or the other. It's a mix and match of all of these. But pretty much all our patients, when they're having either new problem or, you know, like a worsening of pre-existing sleep problem, we are finding that they will have one or more of these four factors. Okay. Do you think, you know, uh, that you know, what is it that people like us can do? You know, there is anxiety, especially for entrepreneurs who are already having uncertainty. The levels of uncertainty have gone up manifold. What is it that we can consciously do to mitigate this anxiety and therefore ensure good quality of sleep? Um, few things in general. Number one, trying to mimic your schedule as best as you can, even while at home, okay? Having dedicated work hours, if you're working from home, you know, having some regular morning walk, exercise. If you can go to the terrace, please do it. If you can, if you're in an apartment and just want to walk, you know, in the stilt area around it, that's fine. Of course, ensure that you're wearing a mask. Of course, ensure that you're maintaining physical distancing, all of those, but, and then doing some yoga, breathing exercises, stretch exercises, some way of doing physical activity is an absolute essential. Okay. Number two, if you are working from home, I always tell people if possible, and again, I can say this, some of it may not be practical. If you can have a dedicated workspace and you are not you know, mixing family and this, and you're just gonna be in your space working, and then you only take like fixed breaks, you know, you might come out for a coffee tea or you may use that, just like how you would at work, you know, have at lunchtime and then go back. Why I'm even mentioning this is, uh, while the productivity might have gone up for some people, a lot of them do slack when they are working from home in the sense, they take an afternoon nap, which affects mm. their nighttime sleep. They watch some video or news or any of those, you know, in between. So that seems to make them even more anxious, worried about the, oh, today is 3,892, yesterday was 2,004. How does it matter? Honestly, it does not. Okay. So yeah, I've stopped watching news on that. Uh, so it definitely is something that we can do when it comes to work. And then once you come out of work and you're having family time, now you don't have the option of going out and dining or, you know, like, you know, going out for a movie or any of those. So try to see what you can do at home to unwind, you know, make something interesting. Who knows, you know, uh, again, you know, this, this, this might sound like an upper middle class syndrome, but, you know, you want to have a nice dinner, sit down dinner, you want to have a candlelight dinner, it doesn't matter. You want to do something exciting, please do it at home, something to unwind, something to relax watch, you know, like a watch a movie or, you know, listening to music, reading books, you know, any of those, if it interests you, again, you know, each one should have their own interest that could help them to unwind. It's absolutely essential. Avoiding screen time very late in the night, because now, you know, people are working from home and they're always on the phone or always on, you know, like a tablet or a computer or something late in the night, all of those should best be avoided. Okay? And as I said, with regards to reducing anxiety, the one thing I would strongly recommend is 
we cannot fix the covid numbers okay so worrying about those you know unnecessarily by looking at media you know repeatedly and not thinking of anything other than that itself is a huge source of anxiety i think you need to consciously withdraw yourself from that and start thinking about other things see how you can get a little bit more involved that itself would make a difference with regards to you know like the work uncertainties you you mentioned about entrepreneurship there's always an opportunity in every crisis you know like in our own example i will tell you you, you mentioned about me we have the chennai critical care consultants group where we are providing you know bedside care for the intensive care um, you know icus across chennai so that part is extremely busy so that company is doing fine okay whereas we also have tac which is the training academy you know now training is zero you know what we do is we train people on life support we train people on you know ventilation how do you manage emergencies trauma and all of that but what we have found and in that you know like we have tried to start making some of those courses online we have tried, which we never thought about before you know we are trying to do some hybrid courses you know interactive online we've also got some large contracts where you know like now the government in whichever scheme is buying ventilators and giving to people who may not know how to use it so we've got contracts on training them remotely on how to use the ventilator okay so yes it is nowhere near what we used to do as far as the num but still it is something and it keeps us going same thing with nitra our sleep center we used to do several sleep studies which are all restricted now because you know we can't go home and do it you know they may have to and you know like we used to do a lot more consultations we used to do a lot of you know the cpap you know trials treatments all of those all this has come down significantly but we have tremendously multiplied the number of tele consultations we do which i am sometimes doing from home or sometimes i may go to the office the office staff have you know uh, reduced the number of times they have to come in so i think we need to think about opportunities that can evolve out of this it may not be perfect it may not be where we were but who knows it may even be better than what we were so that's so, how we so if i were to just summarize what you said because a lot of whole lot of things you said is a try to maintain a steady consistent routine we have a certain kind of discipline especially with respect to eating screen time uh, uh, napping in the afternoon etc number 3 try to carve out some specific time for uh, family time or for some specific interests like mm-hmm. reading music etc and uh, number 4 is uh, try to find out creative ways in which you can manage your anxiety especially with respect to your business absolutely basically now i am very happy to share that our uh, one of our members revathi kandan says that she tries to keep doing something creative ever since march and she is also given a, a a specific site where others could possibly join thank you revathi and anand has given a very interesting phenomenon he says that netflix syndrome is the most common reason for sleep deprivation you know and some people do want your contact so we might share your email id or your uh, you know nitra institute uh, of sleep sciences contact little later absolutely so that should take care of vardarajan now i'm just going to do question 2 which is the type of sleep okay mm-hmm. and uh, saurav can you just ask uh, uh, put up the second question how often have the following problems occurred in the last month not able to sleep getting up in the middle of the night waking up too early feeling drained and exhausted in the morning and none of the above you just give about 10 15 seconds and uh, oh you put your contacts very nice of your doctor my number just for information it is my uh, nitra manager's number but she can connect okay i think we have a few responses so doc uh, getting up in the middle of the night seems to be the most common thing along with feeling drained and exhausted now this seems to be there for quite a few people this feeling of being despite having what you think is a full night sleep uh, if roughly 30% are feeling drained and exhausted in the morning what is the reason and what do you think we can do about it okay number 1 is we have to remember that 
it is not just the quantity of sleep, but it's also the quality of sleep that's essential. There are different stages of sleep. I don't want to get into all those details, but you need to have the right proportion of different stages of sleep. You need to get into deep sleep. And that's what really helps you to feel fresh. Mm -hmm. So quantity and quality make a difference. The quality, as you said, may be affected for people, particularly when there's no sunlight, if they're not getting enough melatonin, then their quality of sleep may not be good. So that is one thing. Okay. The second most common reason for not feeling fresh in the morning is if there is something happening during your sleep. And common example is snoring. People who are snoring have a condition called sleep apnea where their oxygen level comes down. They may not wake up feeling fresh. Okay. Now, you may wonder why should it happen now? Again, you know, like if you don't eat healthy, if you're gaining weight, snoring can be worse. So, you know, it's something to watch out for. If somebody who is not feeling fresh is noted to be snoring or, you know, like uh, having a dry mouth, waking up in the night several times to use the bathroom, then it is important to uh, make sure that you're checked to find out if you have sleep apnea. Another important reason why people wake up in the night is if they have chronic underlying disorders that are not under good control. Typical example is, um, you know, like diabetes. If your sugar is not under control, you may wake up several times to use the bathroom. Men, as we get older, can have prostate problems that wakes us up, you know, you want to empty your bladder. So that's another thing. So uh, unfortunately, during this period, a lot of people are ignoring the management of their chronic diseases, you know, like hypertension, diabetes, they don't go to a doctor. Maybe doctors are unavailable. That's the whole thing. But definitely, you know, like ensuring that you also take care of your chronic underlying disease is extremely, extremely important. So uh, to answer your question, if you don't wake up fresh, think whether you're getting enough quantity of sleep, think whether your, you know, whether your quality might be good or if there is any issue, particularly I've told you what all we can do to improve the quality of sleep in general. And then if you are snoring, it may need evaluation, something to think about. Okay, there's a gentleman called Jawahar who has one or two questions. So I'm going to unmute him and he's going to ask his questions. Go ahead, Jawahar. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Can you hear me, sir? Am yes. I audible? Yes, yes, please. Uh, thank you, doctor. You know, a lot of good insights into both corona and uh, sleep disorders. So, you know, first I have a few questions that I would li like to ask regarding corona. One is... Uh, uh, regarding uh, blood transmission, because uh, you know Tamil Nadu is known for is notorious for transmitting blood, you know that is infected with HIV and things like that. Uh, so I'm wondering uh, if, uh, if at all, if I have to have a blood transfusion in cases like an accident or something, how careful should I be uh, in you know taking blood donation from uh, from someone? You know what kind of test should I do to make sure there is no corona in that blood? That is my first question, doctor. Can we go question by question? Doctor, you can answer this one first. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I, I don't know if I completely agree with you on the fact that Tamil Nadu is notorious for this. It may have happened, you know. The press would talk about the one blood transfusion where there was a transmission, will not talk about the one million transfusions that are not transmitting anything else. Okay? Um, okay. I've heard the Home Minister say that no news is good news on January 27th. <laughs> It is the same way here, you know, like you don't hear about all the transfusion, you only hear about the one that, you know, transfuse some. Now, having said that, I think most blood banks, most good blood banks would have enough, you know, like filters and making sure it is checked before a donor is, you know, bled or it is given to the next, um, I mean, the recipient. So I don't think you should carry that fear too much in general. I'm not talking about the COVID. I'm talking in general, uh, a good blood bank, if you need it, you need it. You know? And at that time, that's what you need. With regards to COVID transmission in blood, as of now, there are no reports, you know, uh, which is all I can say. You know, you know that things are evolving. Right now, there's nothing else. There is no testing to do. There is no antibodies to do or anything like that. Right now, to see whether there is COVID positivity. On another hand, now we are looking for plasma donors. That is something that's becoming, you know, um, you must have heard on TV and in you know, a lot of the media. People who are recovering from COVID infections after 28 days, they, if they now check COVID negative twice, they can be potential plasma donors. So the convalescent plasma seems to help in probably a select group of patients who are on oxygen, who are on BiPAP and all that. It's, it's still, some people call it a trial. But uh, the DCGI, the government has now approved off-label use of uh, convalescent plasma. So there are policies, there are protocols, you have to test COVID negative, it has to be 28 days, all those are there.
that's about all we know right now as far as covid donors i'm talking about covid donors the recipients are only going to receive the plasma of this plasma is just the water component of it not the cells they don't get the red blood cells or the white blood cells or the platelets they only get the fluid in which all these cells are floating so that's the plasma component that they are receiving uh, long answer but in uh, in short blood is usually checked several times and should be safe for taking as of today we don't have a way of testing whether it is you know carrying coronavirus but there is no reported transmission through blood okay, okay jawahar your next question yeah thank you sir uh, so so you know in regards to this uh, doctor like the follow up question is say if there is asymptomatic corona patient uh, today he doesn't know that he has a corona but uh, you know uh, so he goes to the blood bank gives the blood and say in another 2 or 3 days i need blood and then that blood is transfused into my body uh so in between these three days uh is there any checks in the blood bank they do to make sure that person the asymptomatic patient you know he gave the blood right so do they do any checks for corona no right now i don't think it is done i can check okay. with the blood bank again but i don't think it is done okay okay okay, okay. and so, uh, yeah. doctor just any other question or uh, no no we can we'll just we have about 15 20 minutes left i just want to ask doctor about some questions with respect to the state of the healthcare industry So yeah, if you have, yeah, okay. Just Thanks, one more question. Maybe yeah, just one more question, uh, ahead, doctor. Is it uh, so? Uh, uh, is it true that you know people who use uh, common restrooms uh, they get corona? Is corona can be transmitted through restrooms? Talks. See, um, I, I I'll be honest with you. I don't know the accurate answer to this, but there was some concerns, particularly in the US, when they were using public toilets. They were wondering whether it was transmitted there. i have not heard that here uh, significantly but you know like if patient if there are multiple people who have coughed and you're just sitting there uh, that may be one source of transmission but nothing other than that i mean like particularly in a male toilet multiple people standing and somebody is coughing it is more through the aerosol it is not through the urine or it is not through uh, you know any other form i hope to is that you know i'm saying jokingly speaking doctor is that because in india we treat the whole open space as a big open toilet hopefully not any more but yes that's true <laughs> okay now you know i i am all now going to ask you some questions both as an entrepreneur and as a healthcare professional as a entrepreneur in the healthcare industry what is keeping you awake at night if there is one healthcare emergency that has very much negatively impacted healthcare it is this one okay. a lot of the times when some emergency comes whether it's a mass disaster or anything it's just increasing patient dealing with them that's different here we have a situation where there is one particular group of patients that are coming in but that lum number has to be limited we can each hospital may have a limitation on how many of those they can take as i told you it requires a certain change in infrastructure and all of that they may not be able to do all of that um and the number of other patients i mean there is no more wellness checks nobody is coming for routine wellness checks there is no more you know routine out patients uh um, doctors are not doing surgeries dentists have zero practice okay there are some specific um, you know uh, groups of specialists like ent you know all of them where you know the number of patients has drastically come down people are postponing elective surgery for example even something as simple as a cataract people would be postponing surgery so it has taken a huge toll on healthcare in general healthcare is going to take a long time to recover from this uh making changes to scale up on certain things while fully understanding that the income or the revenue is going to be any nowhere near what it used to be earlier there are so many smaller hospitals that are shutting down they may never restart we talk about restaurants and others trust me in that list are lot of small clinics and you know hospitals small hospitals nursing homes they are all going to close i've heard some doctors express severe concern on the fact when I mean, we talk about msme is not having income and all that there are so many doctors without income right now because they're not seeing any patients um we're all in a way glorified daily laborers we are not getting monthly fixed income a lot depends on patients we see and income generated from that so there are so many doctors who i know who are going through depression Who are going through sleepless nights, and 
that keeps awake not just me but several people in healthcare. Can't hear you. No, no, I muted myself so that there is no disturb. Now you said that uh, teleconsultations have jumped. Uh, patients today are comfortable doing something like this, and people are also very comfortable doing online payments. So, in a way, do you think that the future of uh, the healthcare industry is going to change very dramatically, as it is in many other close contact businesses? Yeah. Um, see, I think digital transformation is happening in a lot of things, and healthcare is no exception. And you know, um, there are some specialties that have lent itself beautifully to newer technologies. Like, I mean, ICU is a very technology intense place which we have already I mean, we have been providing tele icu services for america from here for the past 10 years i manage patients in icu in america perfectly comfortably from here you know and uh, we've been doing that for the past 10 years so yes technology is increasingly being used but i must say and i must in fact thank the government the ministry to at a very very appropriate time uh, release the new telehealth guidelines so in March, when this disaster was happening or beginning to happen, the government, the Ministry of Health released the new revised telehealth guidelines. Before that, there were some states which were completely banning. They said, you can't do a telephone consultation. You cannot do a WhatsApp consultation. You cannot, I mean, Karnataka for one state had very clear rules saying you cannot do that and it is not legal. Okay. With the new telehealth guidelines, they have made it you know, possible for any specialty where you can do and talk to them. It may even help with triaging. You all had so many questions about when do I go to a hospital? What should I do? I have a cough here. For that, I don't need to examine you. But if I can see you on video and talk to you and say, are you having trouble breathing? Can you check your temperature and tell me? And now there are remote ways of checking temperatures and all that. So, you know, like there are, you know, uh, technology can be incorporated whereby we can see the patients. Another big, big change that has really helped from this is there are ways of sending prescriptions electronically. And now mm -hmm. uh, the government has approved that if I have written my prescription on an appropriate letterhead, it reflects my registration number, you know, I can, I can send the prescription by WhatsApp, okay? which is extremely good because I cannot use the same telehealth technology that America uses. What do Indians have? A lot of them have smartphones. Okay, so this is a much better, they may not even have email accounts, but they have right. WhatsApps. So it definitely has eased and it is the way forward. It may not lend itself too well to all specialities. You know, there are some where you have to examine the patient, you know, neurologically or, you know, their lungs, their heart sound. Again, there are remote stethoscopes, all that that are coming in. It will take some more time for those adaptations, but a specialty like sleep medicine lends itself beautifully, dermatology, you know, like, so psychiatry, counseling, all of those can certainly be done. So I think it's it's been a great boon uh, that the telehealth guidelines were released. Now, uh, you know, there are a couple of questions, especially Anto SR is very concerned that uh, hospitals are getting overwhelmed, the healthcare system is getting overwhelmed. And therefore, what is your take on uh, what improvements in healthcare infrastructure? Is this a wake-up call for India's healthcare infrastructure? And what key changes need to be made there? I think the number one thing that we need to understand is we need to, uh, in a way, create a standardization and categorize the level of care that can be provided in hospitals. Now, every hospital doesn't need a cardiologist. Every hospital doesn't need an ICU. Every hospital doesn't need a CAT lab or a CT scan or whatever. But we need to have tiered level of care and transferring patients between specialties as required. For example, in our own ICU at Apollo, I would pride myself that we are at tertiary and quaternary care level of ICU. We get a lot of patients who are transferred from other ICUs who you know, cannot be managed there or too sick to be managed. That's how we get. Okay. So a hospital like this should continue to do that because we have the manpower that can handle it. If you overload a small nursing home with 12 COVID patients on a ventilator, there may be one doctor who cannot manage them. Okay. So I think categorizing the facilities, you know, calling them level one care, level two care, level whatever, you know, some, some level of demarcation and moving the patients to varied levels of care is absolutely important. Okay. Number two, you know, is when you want to scale up, understand the needs, you know, even today, as I told you, 80% of the people have mild infections. They don't need to come into a tertiary facility that has an ICU. 
if they're all positive, they could be cohorted in a place, which is what the government facilities are doing right now, because that is what is practical and feasible for us. So doing that for large scale, mass scale, because the so-called home quarantine, home isolation may not be possible for people who are living in small dwellings or don't have homes. So bringing them to the right level of facility would make a difference. Insurance coverage is something that's absolutely important. You know, like uh, it's, I'm glad that there was some recent IRBA statements that, you know, every insurance company has to come up with a COVID specific policy for six months period. And, you know, they have set an upper limit, lower limit, and that there would be no pre-existing clauses in that for the six months, which is great news because unfortunately, even in a private hospital where I work, the number of insured people is probably 30 to 40%. The rest are all paying out of pocket which is not a practical thing right now in India. I think more and more people need to be aware of that. Yes, there is all this government scheme and all that that's coming. People who are eligible need to enroll for that. Those who are not eligible need to take appropriate coverage. Uh, don't think, you know, I wouldn't need this. This is one kind of coverage that I think everybody should have. I'm not really talking about COVID. I'm talking health coverage in general, but definitely during the situation when even youngsters are getting the disease, I think everybody should get appropriate coverage. Okay. Now, there, there are, you know, in some, uh, there have been a difference in how laws have been enforced in different parts of India. Like Kerala, for example, or Assam, the Northeast states have been a little more strict with wearing a mask. Now, Maharashtra has put a fine of 1,000 rupees if you don't wear a mask. Tamil Nadu, uh, fellows like us in Chennai have seen public markets, whether it is Coimbedu or you know, Tirwan Muir or Kasimir, people going very happily uh, without a mask. Now, what do you think uh, needs to be done in order to bring about this culture of hygiene, cleanliness, etc. at an individual level? Is law enforcement the way? And is that the only way that we can really do it? Lee Kuan Yew style in, in Singapore? While I completely agree that you know, uh, we need to enforce all this strictly, I also, also feel that you know the grass is greener on the other side. You know, we think about Northeast implementing this. You know, only when we go there we understand the ground reality. There may be issues everywhere. There's no question. The number is different. Culturally, we may be different. There's no question about it. You know, like uh, I, I honestly, even within southern states, I would find a lot of difference between Bangalore versus Chennai versus you know Kerala. The way it is enforced uh, may be very very different. The mindset is very very different. You know, like. Uh, um, the kind of government they have, what kind of expectations they have. Kerala is very different that way compared to what Tamil Nadu is. So uh, no question about cultural aspects, uh, but I think we need to get stringent with implementing the laws. And I think they're trying, but unfortunately, despite all of that, I don't know whether, you know, uh, penal action is always the answer. I live in Ananagar and I can tell you when you enter the Ananagar Arch, there are about 500 motorcycles parked there because they've all been seized. Okay, by the police for people who are you know driving around unnecessarily somewhere near round tunnel to chindamani i see 200 cars that have been seized that have all been parked okay and they've all been told that after the lockdown you can come and pick it up but why do people behave that way that this has to even happen and yes there is penal action but how has it changed you know you still see people walking around you know with or without masks running you know the, the morning walkers you know with due regards to physical health need to be considered you know, I think that's something that I'm noticing a lot, and that's the reason I'm mentioning it. Okay, uh, I asked the group again, if there are any questions, uh, you know, please uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Otherwise, I think again, Mr. Jawahar has a question, so we're going to unmute him. Okay. Thank Go ahead, sir. Mr. Jawahar. Yeah, thank you, sir, for giving me another opportunity. Uh, Sir, uh, just a couple of more questions I had uh, to ask you. One is, is it possible that the corona can be transmitted through mosquitoes? Uh, any studies relating because malaria is usually transmitted by mosquitoes. So that's malaria why and dengue have been known to be transmitted. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, we are not aware of anything yet. You know, See, and mm -hmm. uh, if you think about it, malaria and dengue are all happening more in places where mosquitoes are present, like more in Africa, more in India. Now, this is a, you know, real pandemic that has affected the globe where a lot of places don't even have mosquitoes. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, is it possible? We don't know. But as of now, there's no report of uh, transmission through mosquitoes. Okay. Sir, and other question I had was, uh, is it possible that a person who got corona 
and uh, you know he got cured and can he get it back again you know, is yeah. it possible i mentioned this in an indirect way earlier when i talked about different viral illnesses like about chicken pox and you know how it evolves when somebody gets chicken pox they either may not get it again at all because they have developed enough immunity or they may get it in a different form as of now we don't know how covid is going to be it's an, in a way a new disease you know we are just knowing what it is we uh, i know of a couple of people who have recovered from covid completely and have got it a second time i don't know them. Okay. okay so is it possible that they can get it yes okay we i don't know whether the immunity is complete uh will it take a different form i don't know actually this person i know has completely recovered both times he's a doctor okay but he's recovered completely both times so it can theoretically happen we don't know the disease enough for me to make clear statements on that okay thanks a lot doctor thank you no no there is uh, one question which came from dr sri ganga about uh, you know this uh, virus coming through sewage and transmission through sewage is that really true not that i am aware of i mean this is something that it was brought up in an indirect way uh, by someone else on you know sharing common toilets and stuff you know uh, not that i am aware of is dr sri ganga a medical doctor if she wants to share i'm happy to wait, wait a minute i am going to try and unmute her wait how do i unmute her okay there we go okay i have man hello ah, okay go can ahead you hear me? yeah yes can you i'm dr sri ganga i'm a consultant geriatrician um and unfortunately the sewage query was not mine um i have a more technical query sorry sorry um, sorry no worries um i have a more in the community we do see quite a lot of patients who uh, seem to be showing symptoms suggestive of covid so we have done a ct scan which is uh, sort of uh, comes back as corad 5 or 6 but the swab negative and when it comes to hospitalizations if they are unwell there's so much confusion in the government institutions as to where they are placed because we've had patients being refused saying the swab is negative uh, you got to go to royal petta but but are there any clear guidelines as to uh, about the uh, swab negative covid patients okay. um couple of things one ct scan can sometimes precede your covid positivity that's one thing we are noticing you know like ct scan changes may occur even before they turn covid positive sometimes it may be there may be a lag of four or five days before somebody turns covid positive if you are strongly suspecting then it may be better to do the test after about four or five days but again just having ground glass opacities in ct scan or you know like having a fever or covid positivity does not mean that they need to be admitted okay if they are symptomatic if they are hypoxic that mm-hmm. is when you need to admit them otherwise no, these, you, these are hypoxic patients yeah finish. okay go ahead sure no these are only hypoxic patients we have been talking yeah, about that you need to be admitted admitted yeah but where how i mean each hospital has their own uh, limitations what we can i mean i might tell even in our emergency room yeah this patient needs admission but i don't have a bed it is possible so that's a whole different story on how we are going to you know scale up to have adequate beds um but it's a, it's a real issue we are we are sometimes sending patients out of from our emergency room saying there's no beds we have several other beds that are empty but i cannot take a covid patient in that thank you okay we have come to uh, the time is about 627 and uh, we had asked doctor for time between 5 to 630 i think we have taken a lot of his time so i'm sorry we can't be physically present and there's no way i can virtually give you a memento doctor so thank you very much for uh, uh, this one and a half hours of your time and walking us through the life in the icu in critical care and what to do about improved sleep and the state of the healthcare industry plus your own personal experiences so with this from on behalf of kai chennai and all the audience uh, participants here thank you very much really appreciate your sharing your time and expertise and knowledge with us Thank you very much it was a real pleasure. Thank you everybody for being here. Okay. Good night and have a good uh, stay safe and sound. Have a good night sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you Saurabh. Yes sir. Thank you. I'll I'll be ending the chat. Yes please.